um, as we gather together uh, as a group of graduate students in um, public interest technology and related uh, studies to really talk about our work and what has led us here. Um, and so uh, I have fellow panelists here and I just have so much honor to be with them um, with uh, the work that they do uh, and to learn and hear from them about their own journeys into this field um, as we get ready to get started at this point. And uh, I think that we're each going to take the opportunity to share a little bit about our own journeys. We'll take turns in that. Um, and then we will be moving into a uh, conversation uh, with questions and answers. And so we certainly welcome your questions in the Q&A. Um, we welcome your feedback in the chat. Uh, and we look forward to really having um, a wonderful, robust discussion with you all about what these paths and journeys can look like um, as we share a bit of our own experience and, and really learn from each other as well. Um, perhaps we could just take the opportunity for each of us to, to say hi. So my name is Toby Schulroth and I am in the Public Interest Technology Program, uh, brand new at Arizona State University in the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. Salah, would you like to say hello? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Salah. I am uh, a second year PhD student in the Innovation and Global Development Program uh, in the School for the Future of Innovation uh, at Arizona State University. Um, and um, yeah, my focus is really on the, uh, the technology uh, in the financial sector. And I'll tell a little bit more about that uh, as we go along. I'll just pass the mic now to uh, Mar Martin. Thank you. Uh, I'm Martin Perez Comiso. I'm a Chilean PhD student in Arizona State too. Um, I'm in the program that's called Human and Social Dimensions of Science and Technology. And my main research is about like how we understand and how we think about technological systems, in particular in the relationship with uh, development and like uh, international ways to understand technological problems. Elma? Do you know? Hi, my name is Elma Heyrich. I'm in the same program as Martin in the Human and Social Dimensions of Science and Technology at ASU. Um, I'm interested in data governance, especially data rights regarding surveillance, ownership, and privacy. Um, and I'll pass it off to Farah. Hello, everybody. My name is Farah and I am a Mexican doctoral student. I am in the same program as Salah, Innovation and Global Development. Uh, it's the same school as everybody, School for the Future of Innovation in Society. And I am interested in studying, especially smart city technologies from um, a feminist, intersectional uh, feminist approach and thinking how these technologies could uh, hinder or help in challenges that the global cities have. Um, so, and yeah. Wonderful. I see that um, our moderator has joined us. Uh, hey. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. I, I hear that everybody's introducing themselves. Has everybody gone through and at least given a quick intro? Great, great. Yeah. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties on my end, but I do have a fan above my head, so. Uh, so I want to welcome everybody who is here. Um, this is the Best Practices in PIT programs. And I am Jamie Wetmore. I'm the Associate Director for Academic Programs at the School for the Future of Innovation and Society at ASU. And I'm here to admit that if you actually want to learn about PIT programs, the last person you should talk to is an administrator, which is why we have five students we have pulled together who I think represent five different um, uh, sort of pit aligned graduate degree programs. Um, I think what you will learn is that if you come to ASU as a graduate student, you want to get a second graduate degree, because I think we have at least three of you, I think, are involved in that. Um, so I'm excited to hear a little bit, um, mainly about the journeys that you all have, are going, are you, are you all in the midst of that you are doing? Um, we, uh, we as educators are trying to help you make the difference in the world that you want to make. Um, so I'm excited to hear about what those differences are and how you're going to do it. Um, 
and maybe give us a critique of things we need to fix in our graduate programs along the way. Um, I think we have it set up uh, five to six minutes for each of you. Uh, when we hit five minutes, I will give you all the warning sign. Maybe I'll raise a hand or something like that um, to let you know you need to wind down. But uh, other than that, I'm going to be quiet and let all of you talk. So um, uh, we're going to go in. Uh, Toby Shore, uh, you are first on my list. So the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you uh, to New America to and to uh, everyone who organized this event for welcoming me into this space. Um, I am joining you all from the traditional and unceded land of the Kalapuya, Cowlitz, and Atfalati nations outside of Portland, Oregon. For 20 years, I have been working at the intersection of technology and gender-based violence. So in my work, I see every day the risks and the harms of technology, how location tracking, the internet of things, big data and online spaces can quickly turn into tools of harassment and stalking. It's clear to me that tech is not neutral. It should be no surprise that the technologies of our time, rooted as they are in a history of command and control, should be misused to control a partner or their children, or that business models predicated on persuasion should so easily slip into coercion. It's foundational, it's not surprising. But I do also see that technology is used to increase safety and privacy in spite of it all. Um, driven by the creativity and the resilience of survivors of violence and those in every community who are supporting them, um, I've seen those creative uses uh, work to the benefit, right? I've also seen eager, well-intentioned tech developers define problems and design solutions that don't really help or even worse, sometimes cause more harm. Please hear me say this. We do not need another panic button, really. <laughs> I'll talk about that a little bit more at the ISTAS conference uh, tomorrow morning. But um, I think you've joined because you want to know why we all joined the Public Interest Technology Program or PIT aligned programs. Um, I joined because I crave a community exploring the imperative that technology should serve society and the planet. To serve society, technology in its design and development needs to be rooted in the needs and priorities of all communities. Um, but technology, like the future, is not evenly distributed. Thank you, William Gibson. The pandemic has starkly revealed that, if there was any doubt. So what's the alternative? It's the meaningful involvement of people who are disproportionately impacted by the unintended consequences of technology. It's victims of violence, people with disabilities, women and trans folk, uh, black, brown, and indigenous communities in the US and globally. Not coincidentally, these are the same communities who are kept at the margins of power in society. This isn't simply about the digital divide and increasing access so people can be equal consumers of technology. It's about shifting who does technology and how we think about technology. To me, that goes uh, beyond a narrow Western frame. Right? When we look at the roots and the applications of technology and public interest technology, so much of the literature situates the roots in, of responsible innovation, um, of technology in, for the public good in the European enlightenment. And we have this narrow definition of who does tech in Silicon Valley and other hubs of innovation today. Um, but at Arizona State University, here at the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, we say that the future is for everyone. So the question isn't about some token view of how tech can look more diverse, but how can tech development be shifted um, all the way from its foundations to the outcomes that we see. So what can we learn from the intentions and applications of technology in the flourishing of Islamic science in China and India, uh, innovators of so many technologies that we take for granted globally today? and in the long traditions and vibrant current living indigenous cultures um, and how they develop and use technology. These aren't just dusty historical inquiries, um, but they lead to a more robust conversation about how technology is designed and deployed in the public interest globally today. And really, who owns the future? So what's next for me? 
um, I want to collaborate in shaping this field of public interest technology. I think we should build out a toolbox for students, for practitioners, for technologists, with practices like co-design, uh, meaningful community participation. How do we meet and work together? Um, skills like systems thinking and design, futuring, storytelling, iteration, strengths like curiosity, flexibility, and a maker mindset. And it's really, really important that we're in this for the long haul, that we're not just like helicoptering in with some donated good solution, but that we're there for the long haul to really work with communities um, and, and more so to empower communities, right? To turn over the tools of design and development to communities themselves. Um, so I'm so honored to be here with my fellow panelists. I can't wait to hear from them about the work that they're doing. Um, and then just at this convening with uh, my faculty and longtime heroes um, in the privacy and tech world. So thank you. Thank you, Toby. Um, next up, we have uh, Farah Nehar Arevalo. And uh, Farah finished her Master's of Science in Global Technology and Development and decided that wasn't enough. So she is now in the uh, PhD in Innovation and Global Development. Farah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, and yeah, um, I think my journey in public interest technology has um, two moments. One is uh, the one that Jamie pointed out. So I am in the Innovation and Global Development PhD as a consequence or as a sequel of having done the master's in global technology and development. And both programs are very tied to each other. Um, and that's how the, some of the questions, similar questions to what Toby has mentioned um, have arrived to in the discussions with uh, the people that are in this panel. But I think uh, my journey started um, in my early, professional career. So I have a, a bachelor in international affairs in Mexico, and I have worked in uh, the tech or close to the tech industry back then, and also in a big federal or a smart city project in my city. So I think uh, my undergrad studies plus these, the experience, the work experience let me to, to pursue something. Uh, and, and if I could share the story. So I work in an NGO that fosters the development of the local tech industry, but also collaborates with international IT and technology companies like Intel, IBM. And um, when I was there, that's where I learned about uh, the concept of smart cities. It was in a presentation from Cisco and it sounded very appealing and very interesting um, to me. And, and I didn't consider the questions and the concerns most people uh, share now. Um, but then uh, I, in the 2015, I attended a side event put up by Microsoft and Google in uh, New York. And it was a side event of the adoption of the United Nations Sustainable, Sustainable Development Goals and they were speaking about how technology can support the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And they created like this narrative around technology for development. Um, and I felt like that's kind of the space that I needed to be. Uh, I, it was, it really appealed to me. And that's how I, I felt I could bridge my undergrad studies with my work experience. So I actually, I. I, start, I started searching for programs that bridge technology uh, studies, but also development studies. And to anybody uh, who uh, have not heard before about what development studies is, uh, it's a program, graduate program, that it's mostly found uh, at um, Western universities in the US, um, in Northern Europe, um, in Australia. Uh, there are very few programs in Latin America uh, that looks at how we think of nations being developed, not developed, what terms make sense, the third uh, versus uh, first world notions, uh, should we call them emerging economies? So that's kind of uh, the programs outside as you were 
Um, but I wanted to do something that related that to technology and the role of um, technologies, but also those who make technologies and how they make. So I started like an internet search uh, of programs. I search uh, technology studies, development studies, and I found like two programs, one in DC, uh, it was a development studies for um, masters with a concentration in technology and development. And I found the SFIS School for the Future of Innovation in Society website. I emailed Mary Jane, the chair of the program. I told her, like, we exchanged some emails and I applied, and that's how I'm here. Um, and however, uh, in my time uh, working in Mexico, both in this tech NGO and then later in the Smart City project, I felt like I was, I was having this very techno deterministic. Uh, conceptions of development, which were challenged <laughs> in the GTD, Global Technology Development Program. I think another element that added to my journey was spending time with uh, the human and social dimensions uh, of technology. Uh, PhD students like Martin, who is here, um, Elma came later, uh, uh, Toby I just met. Um, but it was, I think, uh, my ex work experience plus my undergrad studies um, and my inquiry to study development um, and the community around our school, the idea sharing. Um, I think that's how, what has led to my journey. Uh, right now, I am studying uh, uh, smart cities uh, from a feminist intersectional fe uh, perspective, like making question how the technologies uh, in smart city serve, who is a user in the smart city? Is there a normative user who is left out? Um, so I'll leave more of that later after uh, the next round of questions. Thanks, Farah. Uh, next up, we have Salah Hamdoun, who is in our PhD in Innovation and Global Development at ASU. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, so. Um, um, I guess my, my journey began um, in the Netherlands. I was born and raised there. I studied business, uh, business there. Although I, after high school, I started, um, uh, uh, I actually wanted to become a software engineer. Uh, so I, I studied software uh, I, and I really made, and I really realized at a certain moment that I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more about the, so what is, what goes beyond just the, uh, the software design, the applications. Um, so I decided to study business like anyone else would. Um, so I, I, I did that. I, I finished uh, my, business, my uh, international business uh, degree in the Netherlands and I moved to London and then I started working for a bank. And um, uh, I moved to the Middle East. And, um, and, and so during my time there where I worked for financial markets, um, I, uh, I looked at things like uh, as liability management, uh, FX dealing, um, and, uh, and, and, and investment uh, programs. But what really made me realize, and that what really made me realize that I wanted to know more was um, I saw how the, the banking world operated from the inside, how technology became more and more important, especially during the financial crisis how markets started to become um, attractive. Markets that banks were not interested in before uh, started to become really attractive because of the, the technology that now allows people to bank through their phones and, um, uh, and, 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 and basically do, and basically have access to a lot of the uh, banking product. Now, my interest in how banks functions within function within those societies um, was also driven by the fact that I I myself came uh, no, I was born in the Netherlands my parents came from Morocco so I always knew about the, um, the idea and how certain institutions participate in the development of, of communities um, I moved from the Middle East in 2015 to DC and that's where I really start to, you know, my network, um, start engage with people who were dealing with policy and who were dealing with um, um, questions surrounding development and the technology that, uh, that aids them. 
And um, that's where I decided to go back to school. After a couple of years of working, I decided to go back to school and start my PhD, really focusing on the, my main, you know, so the main question I want that I'm focusing on is, so how does, how do programs like financial inclusion or financial technology really contribute to the um, social, the, the uh, uh, social inclusion or human development as it's known among a lot of people. Um, and that's, and that's basically where I started my, my journey at the, at Arizona State University. The reason why I was so attracted to uh, the program at Arizona State University was the, the as, you know, as you, that's why I also mentioned the international journey that I took. Um, it, it feels as if everyone understands what it is to operate on a global scale, on a global level. Uh, when I speak about Morocco, I can find people in there, in the program that actually went to Morocco, did projects in Morocco. No, Morocco better than I do, or whether I talk about the Netherlands. So it is, it is, those are very easy conversations to have. Um, and with the interest that I have, then it is uh, just, you know, it, it, the discussions are more richer in a sense, right? So when I talk, when I talk about, you know, um, you know, some certain communities and how technology applies, there's always someone who um, is able to, um, uh, yeah, be able to, to have that discussion with me. Um, so as I said, I, I'm, I'm really interested in developing or um, participating in the thinking of um, developing alternative uh, solutions, uh, things that technology can provide. And as Toby mentioned, um, it, you know, technology is neither good or bad. It is really what we, what we make of it. And, um, and, and that design, the design for, the design for people, with people, um, through people, it, it, it is so essential for us to, um, uh, to, to create that future that we all want. Um, I see specific challenges in the, uh, in the area of financial technology. There are, um, uh, there are um, stakeholders uh, that are now involved that were not there five or 10 years ago. And we have to understand what their philosophy is. We have to engage them in those stories. Uh, 10 years ago, we were not talking about Google entering uh, the payment system, but now we do. And we have to understand what is their philosophy? How do they want to, how do they see communities? How do they, uh, um, uh, what can their technology contribute? Um, and really just being part of that discussion is, is going to be very essential. Um, and I think the added value that I bring uh, in, in this program is understanding um, organizations from the inside um, and uh, not fearing these organizations. I, I have been inside the bank. I have dealt with central banks. And it is, it is really, um, and, then, and that is the one thing that I can, um, you know, the one thing that I can tell you is that whatever experience you have, take it with you, bring it with you. This is, you can use it. Whatever you have done um, is going to be extremely useful. So, so take that knowledge with you and um, yeah, and it, it's going to be, it's going to come to a very rich uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Sola. Um, next up we have Elma Herrick and she also is a double dipping, uh, starting with the Masters of Science and Technology Policy and now on to the PhD in Human and Social Dimensions of Science and Technology. Elma, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jamie. Um, as mentioned, I am part of the HSD program at ASU. I'm a first year PhD student and I did in fact do the Master of Science and Technology Policy. Um, my area of focus is in data governance, especially privacy, ownership, and surveillance. Um, and I'm also part of the NSF NRT grant for citizen-centered smart cities and smart living. That really puts an emphasis on creating people-centric um, smart cities. With emerging technology becoming more ubiquitous and more intrusive, um, and data really running the foundation for all of these new technologies that are coming out, it's imperative that we also maintain some kind of semblance of human rights in digital spaces. And that's really what I'm focused on. How do we extend digital rights through data rights um, as a human right? And 
these are big questions that I'm grappling with. Um, but how I got here is my background. Um, I'm a refugee. I came to the United States as a refugee from Bosnia. I was first a refugee in Germany, and then we came here. And during my undergrad, I grew up in Arizona for the most part, and during my undergrad, I studied international affairs and German. I also worked as a tech support assistant and was able to find a role in bridging the communication between technicians and the students that we were supporting. Um, and that was completely irrelevant to my studies, but there was a running theme throughout my life also with loving technology and kind of being pretty intuitive with technology. Um, but after I graduated, I found it really difficult to find a job and to navigate the industry space um, as a first generation college student and as a refugee, I didn't have those networks required. And I figured out throughout the years that I needed to go back and get a master's degree. Um, but between my master's degree and graduating, I worked in corporate um, in an administrative role where I continued to apply these uh, tech support skills to my coworkers and really understood the business needs um, for productivity and efficiency and helping our team meet those goals. But it wasn't suitable for me completely. I needed more um, challenging ways to think and I wanted to go back to my roots with human rights and international affairs and continue that line of um, work somehow. And policy was a good bridge to that. To keep relevant to those issues, I also volunteered with our local chapter of Amnesty International and continued um, this flow of human rights centered um, approaches. And that also br brought up some alarms about surveillance technologies and the disproportionate implications of these surveillance technologies as Toby mentioned in her introduction. Um, and, you know, that led me to studying data and surveillance during my master's science technology policy. But these questions just created more questions rather than answers. And I also found myself with my intersectional experience and kind of both at the industry level and personal levels, I found myself in a good spot to be able to um, reflect on these questions and offer a different perspective to the normal perspectives that are usually brought in academic spaces. Um, and I think this is kind of what we need more of in industry and in academia. We need to break these power asymmetries and we need to find ways to incorporate people who are disproportionately affected by these technologies to have them reflect on what it is that we actually need and how to create better futures for everybody. Um, and that's really where I found myself. Also, I really love the environment that ASU had to offer. I, for the first time, found myself in spaces that actually um, challenged me and that actually offered opportunities. Um, and respected my skill sets where, you know, there are so many people who are like me in humanities who can understand this technology, but just don't have this pathway to actually show their talents and actually have some kind of input into these spaces. And we really need to create more bridges in order to create technology that is of public interest. Um, yeah, so these are big questions that we're grappling with together and I look forward to talking more about it. Thanks, Emma. And uh, next up is Martin Perez Cominso. And Martin is working on his PhD in human and social dimensions of science and technology. Martin. Thank you, Jamie. And thanks uh, to New America Amistas for the opportunity to talk and share my experience. Um, before, like, Public interest only appears like a network or a collectivity. Uh, I'm joined the Human Social Dimensions of Science and Technology program in ASU uh, because I have a strong interest in a discipline or field that's called like, science and technology studies. Um, one of my main questions is like, how do how do we do a better world with technology? 
and and that I think has like a lot of relationship with like uh, and parallelism with what public interest technology entails. Technologies are produced and used by humans and not digital or physical infrastructure community is purely isolated. In that way, I'm interested in how humans become part of a geotechnical system. This is this network of intertwined things and people that people take different roles as inventors, maintainers, designers, regulators, users, and hackers. And I'm trying to study and understand like the networks of that. But in particular, I think that like we tend to observe these situations as like fixed uh, for specific roles. We tend to like have narratives about like successful inventors or like how users are pervasive, like the designers are pervasive or how users are neglected. But I think like we move through all these roles over days with different technologies, but we um, have a struggles to think about them because we don't have like the tools and like uh, the um, strategies to democratize this kind of like deep reflection about our technological world. Um, I think this is in part because we, we share uh, hegemonic images about technology, like robots or computers or autonomous vehicles or smart cities among others that like often are like reproducing the media or we are like talking about like emerging things, but we tend to neglect how all that things requires data centers and like cords connecting things and electricity and like a lot of work in different places in the world is interconnected. And I think in a world that like the interdependencies are more clear, um, I'm really interested to research and connect and synthesize ideas for make larger audiences able to engage with uh, this kind of thinking that is fundamental, I think, to understand the, the world that we have created and the crisis that we are produced after like the industrial revolution. Uh, for, uh, for that way, I'm interested in particular in my PhD to explore ideas about technological development, technological appropriation, and more recently, images of futures and images of technology. Uh, I'm deeply committed with the role of education, and I want to become an educator after my program. Uh, I had the privilege to to, be lect to uh, lecture in Chile for several years before I arrived here, and the PhD for me is a time to like connect and like synergize all these ideas. And I think uh, the program in ASU and the School of Future of Innovation Society is one of the best places in the world to do it. Um, it's the largest college in the world uh, for this area with more than like 50 faculties and like now to other uh, schools with sustainability and complex systems to um, impulse the um, ways of thinking needed to understand the complexities of technologies. Um, among different things that I have been involved, um, I'm interested to um, collaborate with communities of educators around the world. Um, during this pandemic, in particular with some friends and colleagues, we uh, did a collaboration with the state official NGO in Chile to support teachers of technology in Chile. There is like a, a course that like is in, from the primary to the high school that is mandatory and like the teachers have like very little training or tools. And in particular with this pandemic and all this like digital teaching, they was like really struggling with that. And I use my networks and my strategies and learnings that I have got in ASU to put together at 18 weeks a webinar series with guests from all around the world for them. Uh, most of them, most of the talk was in Spanish because that like so the language that we speak, but also to like bring all these different ideas and strategies that I have been learning here on how like we can empower these teachers. Um, I hope that I'll share some other things in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we are we are open for questions. So if you have questions, you can put them into the Q and A or the chat. I believe. Um, in the meantime, I have a quick question for all of you. Uh, and Martin, you started hinting at it. I think you may have already started to answer this, but but I'm going to ask it of everybody. Uh, so it's very clear all of you see wrongs in the world that you would like to see righted 
and it's very clear that you'd like to be part of that process of righting those wrongs. So why go to school? Why, uh, what, what, is the, what is the motivation to go and get a graduate degree? Uh, why not just jump into the field, get your hands dirty and start trying to make the change? So not to critique grad school, I'm just curious, you know, what is the motivation that is bringing you um, back to school? Well, I, uh, well, I went, I'm the one of the few who went, actually went back to school after a few years, so I may take the test out of that. Um, um, I think for, for me, it was really um, the, uh, understand the alternative approach, right, to, to do deeper research, to find, um, to find some of the, to find some of the knowledge that I was not thinking about. So basically the question was, the question was not so much Oh, well, I have to go to grad school again just to get a degree. It was more, what do I, what do I not know, and how then am I able to participate uh, in the discussion? So it was well, for me. It was more, how can I bring that richer discussion? Um, uh, how can we come to a richer discussion about something that I knew was wrong, and, and I knew I wanted to 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 fix, um, but then you need all the you know, you, you come with a with a bag of knowledge uh, and, and methods and how to approach a certain problem. And I think that for me was the, um, you know, the added value. Um, for me, uh, I, you know, I have over 20 years in my field um, working on the issues that I care about, but there's, there's a couple pieces there. One is that so much of our work within NGO space is like the grateful recipients of donations of technology, or in my specific work, helping people to navigate harms that they're experiencing without really having the power to change the systems that are causing the harms. We're aware of those systems, but that's really why I came to this program was that I wanted um, the time, because in NGO work and probably in most paid jobs, right, like, but in, in my work, it's like one thing and another thing and another thing. And I have to, you know, have enough expertise in location technology and IoT and big data to be able to answer these questions that make a difference to a person's actual safety and their life, right? And, and so I wanted to be able to step back and take um, a higher level view and a deeper view uh, to weave together a lot of what I had seen through my work with theory. I knew a lot of clever people were thinking clever things about this. <laughs> and so I wanted to connect to all of them and to be in a community. And even just my first months in this program have shown that as I'm just inspired and lifted up and amazed by the work that I hear in my fellow students, um, and my faculty in the experts who have been brought in to, to talk to our programs and that we're connecting to through this co convening. So for me, it's community um, and that ability to, to affect on a more deep level um, the wrongs that I'm seeing. I, I have an answer that like is related to like what uh, degree will enable to you. And um, for me, there is like four big things. The first is like tools that I haven't uh, had the opportunity to develop. And there's like methodologies there, but also there's like theoretical tools or strategies. The second, there is like the degree, it's also some way of recognition. And there is like a, a social validation in particular for me that I'm interested to work in academia. Like you require a PhD degree to do a career in that. Uh, the tier is like the contacts, like and networking, like uh, the school that you uh, engage and you decide to go, like we'll enable to um, have access to a specific experts and people, and that, that makes me decide for ASU, for the large amount of people that is like moving around here, that is impressive. And the last one I think is the opportunities, because I think grad school is in a space that like you can fund ideas that like in the real world have like less probabilities to succeed in the way that like you can like experimentate with more freedom and like engage with more an exploratory pathway that helps you to grow, not just as a scholar or a professional, but also as a person. And engage with those opportunities is something that like, like a regular job, like often don't allow it. Sure, okay. Um, I think, um, well, and the, those who have worked in 
uh, NGOs, uh, industry, Matt, could you agree on this? When you are working day by day uh, and you do like annual planning, quarter planning, you're consumed by operations, daily operation on solving problems. Oh, there's this issue and you have to like, there's like a fire, you have to like put water quickly. Um, uh, and I was privileged in the space where I worked. Uh, uh, I, I work with very, very uh, smart and motivating people who pushed me to think more, um, but still we were consumed by uh, event planning and projects and like submitting reports. And I feel that uh, the school, what the school provides that other spaces don't, is just time to be critical or to think so you are encouraged like that's what you do you study something you criticize you have to propose a explanation so for me I think the why school answer is because it's a space to you're encouraged to think and come up with your own theories and explanations um, I think also it provides uh, a structure of thinking and problem solving which you can also get that structure of problem solving with, as, elsewhere, right? But it's a, it's a framework of how to approach phenomena. I think the system thinking part came from me precisely in the, my masters. And, and also I agree with this being said before, it's like a network of thinking people. And I don't wanna say outside, there's not thinking people, but everybody is grappling with these questions like Elma shared, um, uh, like the questions that it, Toby, everybody shared. So it's a constant like ping pong of questions and somebody makes you think of another. So, so this space to be critical and think is fostered by other thinkers like you who are in the same path and, and are not consumed by office work or project management work. And my answer to that, um, I was actually hesitant to go back to school. Um, after my master's degree, I had intended to go find a job in industry or somewhere else. Uh, during my master's degree, I actually had the opportunity to work at GAO, the Government Accountability Office, with their new science and technology assessment and analytics team. And I really cherished this opportunity and experience. And I would have loved to continue working there if they had opportunities coming right up. Um, but you know, these opportunities take time to develop. And with my passion for data rights, um, I really wanted to continue creating meaningful conversations in this space that I didn't find available anywhere else. Um, and I also feel like this is a wicked problem, right? Like there's just so much to it. And I needed to learn more about the socio-technical approaches um, to understanding this pro problem at a deeper level. But I also feel like academia, it, it, it's an unknown space for me, right? I'm, I didn't grow up it with academia being a career path. I didn't know it was a career path until I was doing my master's degree. But even then I was really hesitant, you know, to jump into and dedicate my life to a PhD. Um, but I feel like I thrive in this environment and I feel like I belong in this environment. Um, I think it, within HSD in particular, all of my inquiries are being pushed and challenged. And you know, there's so much opportunity for collaboration and from learning from people, uh, professors who have great expertise and are thought leaders in their areas and spaces. So I think it's a unique opportunity and like looking at it, I don't know why I wouldn't go to academia. I guess. So, uh, so I like everybody, great answers, great answers. I, I like this, you know, when you're caught up in the middle of a day-to-day -day job, you just don't have that time to sit back and think big picture. It seems like that's a big motivation for a lot of you. So there is an old saying that um, those who can do and those who can't teach. Um, um, so many of the instructors, not all, many of the instructors that you all have in these programs have spent most of their lives in academia talking about making change, but maybe not actually making too much change out there in the, in the real world, uh, except for students. When everybody asks, what impact do I hope to have? I always say, I'm hoping my students actually do something with the, <laughs> with the time we've had together. 
But I'm curious for all of you, it's clear that you all believe it's really important to step back and think big picture and reflect on theory. At the same time, I can tell you all still want to get out there and get your hands dirty and be on the front, front lines of change. So as a student, how do you balance that? Um, especially since traditionally academia doesn't reward people who leave the ivory towers. You're, you're rewarded for interacting with others within academia. So, Toby, you look like you're chomping at the bit. I, I am. I am chomping at the bit. Um, and and like to respectfully disagree. And part of the reason that I chose ASU and the School for the Future of Innovation and in Society is because it is applicable. And my professors do work in the real world. Um, you know, uh, Elma mentioned working at GAO um, on their technology analysis and um, team and. Uh, so, you know, two of my professors worked for the Office of Technology Assessment in DC before coming to academia. And another professor developed a tool to be actually used and applied, right? And, and what I hear consistently at SFIS and also just the broader College of Global Futures is it doesn't matter if we can't actually make a difference in the world. Um, and I, I think it would be like, I, I would still go to grad school, even if it was just the theory, because I also have my full-time day job at the same time. So I am still making a difference um, to answer more directly your question. Um, but it has surprised and delighted me how much um, the school is grounded in this having to mean something and be applicable and not just be words on a page or words in a video conference. Uh, I want to agree with Toby in this too. I think the work that, like, not just SFIS, I will like, I, there is like a specific examples that SFIS has that are very clear, like Lorreen Killer working in the Tempe Action Climate Change Plan, or Marta Berbes with Minority Communist Futures, Fahim uh, with uh, Hussein with Refugees and the Idol Afterlife, or like Laura Hosman, I worked with her in the last two years, uh, with Solar Spell helping to access education in the remote places in the world. And all of those projects and all the projects most faculties have in the school are projects really applicable con with direct communities and stakeholders. But also, and this is something that I think the PIT community have the opportunity to engage a lot more, is like the field that like, uh, to me motivates me to make my PhD in HSD, uh, it's science and technology studies. And if there is an increasingly space for applied practices and engaging with communities that is evaluated scholarly too. That is not just go and present papers and essays, it's go and present your projects and your classes and your policy projects and your engagements and your movies and your documentals and things that like make impact to others. I think that is fundamental to, to think that I think Pete, that in some form it um, came from this tradi tradition of technology and society that's had like more than 100 years uh, of like theoretical history and practical history uh, can also have considerations about like how we make change in the world with the new ideas that we produce. I, um, yeah, I would like to second that. I, um, I absolutely agree. I mean, one of the reasons that I connected, I mean, one of the many reasons I connected with my, with my professor, uh, Katina Michael, um, so much is because of her, because of her experience in in the field, and she is an example of how yes, you can thrive in the, you know, in the in the for profit or in the non profit, um, and still be an excellent uh, professor in academia. It is, and I and, and and there's one there's one thing that I um, that I've noticed. It is just you know the love for your work and. As long as as long as you can keep doing that and express that, um, people will recognize that and um, and 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 you know, follow your lead. So it's 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 different. Every per it's it's different, but it's every person has a different experience. But um, I, I absolutely agree with what Toby already mentioned and Martin is that the um, knowledge from the field, but also the knowledge getting knowledge from the field, but also um, making sure that the uh, make sure that the, the, the knowledge that you produce uh, reaches the different parts of society in different ways. And, and, and therefore we cannot be stuck in the ivory tower. Um, it is definitely finding ways to um, share, share your knowledge and, and, and gain knowledge. 
Yeah, I think uh, the SFIS culture is really focused on um, incorporating practices like citizen participation and outreach and, you know, actually applying the things that we learn um, through initiatives and incentives like knowledge mobilization projects. And, you know, these degrees, like my master's degree is really focused on public service and it's focused on how do you communicate with the public um, and how do you, you know, create technologies and scientific tools that is of interest in the public and, and actually make an impact. But also this HSD program, um, as theoretical as it is, there are also elements that make it applicable and, and continue to cha challenge and force us to apply these projects to the public. Um, also being part of the NSF NRT grant on citizen-centered smart cities and smart living, it's citizen-centered and the entire program is cultivated around how do we actually engage with the public and how do we create meaningful impact that is applied beyond the things that we're learning. I want to add one more thing. I, I, I agree with that. I want to add one more thing is that when you look at the Innovation Global Development Program, um, we do not have the luxury of just talking to each other. Uh, the world moves on very, very quickly, and we need to understand what is on the ground. That is one of our incentives to really look at how, uh, how are people interacting with uh, institutions, how uh, what is the effect of COVID right now? What is the effect of uh, poverty in one place and not the other place? How do, you, how do states function? And for that, you really need to be on the ground. There is no, the luxury of just staying and just talking to each other is, is um, it's, it's just not applicable in my program. I'll add some, something very quick because, uh, because this is a question I have struggled myself during the pandemic because I have, I have encountered that question for me since we, I have been on Zoom since March, like everybody, but, but to, to what my peers have said, like we have also the type of faculty who do activism through their academic and research work. Uh, so, so we have the model, like the future is for everyone and, um, and the IGD program, Netra Chetri, our program chair, he always says like, how do you elevate those that are systematically marginalized? So we are pushed with this question, but I have also seen how a different uh, faculties in our school do this activism through their publication, through their work. Um, so I think that's one, another way to, to maybe they, they do leave occasionally, sometimes they don't, but what, even if they don't leave, they're writing there and they're push, uh, challenging those systems of power so, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. That was great. And um, thank you to New America and to the IEEE for giving us this format to do this. And I wish you all the best of luck. And I look forward to, uh, yeah. Well, I look forward to watching you walk across those stages so that uh, we can hand you those degrees. But more importantly, I look forward to seeing you all in class because that's where I learn the most. So um, thanks for a great session. and. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, New America. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.